Hi, I'm Jake Spano. I'm the Marketing Director for the City of St. Paul. This November, there'll be some pretty big changes that'll be coming to the ballots that voters see in voting booths as they make their choices for City Council races. Today, joining us is Joe Mansky. Joe works for Ramsey County Elections and he's going to talk to us a little bit about what we can expect, some of the common mistakes that might be made and, uh, and how those can affect your ballot. Joe? Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your role is with St. Uh, Paul Elections. Sure, Jake. I'm the Ramsey County Election Manager and among our various duties is administering elections for the City of St. Paul. And uh, in that capacity, we're, we're responsible for everything that goes on. We set up the polling places, we hire the election judges, print the ballots, you know, basically the whole nine yards. So this fall, uh, the November election, we're going to see a new form of voting on our, for city council races, ranked voting. That's correct. Explain a little bit uh, briefly about kind of how is ranked voting different than traditional voting? Ranked voting pretty simply is, is this, that in a traditional election where you have uh, people running for an office, you vote for one person and then you move on to the next office. With ranked voting, people will have the opportunity, if they want to, to indicate to us what their preference is among the candidates who are on the ballot. So for example, if there are two candidates that are of interest to you, you can rank one of them your first choice, rank the other person your second choice, and that way if your first choice is not, uh, doesn't have enough votes to win initially, it might be possible for your second choice vote to get allocated to some other candidate. So why the shift to ranked voting? What, what was the impetus that set this in motion? Uh, pretty simple. We had a charter amendment on the ballot in 2009 to uh, change our city election process from the traditional voting method to the ranked voting method. And the voters approved that by a vote of 52 to 48 percent. And so as a consequence, starting this year, year, uh, our city council election and then our election for mayor in two years will be conducted using this ranked voting method. Now we also have school board elections that are on the ballot. Those are not ranked voting, correct? That is correct. Our school board election is using the traditional voting style and next year when people are voting for the state and federal offices, uh, similarly, that will also be held in the traditional method. So they'll have one side of the ballot will be ranked voting, city council races, and on the opposite side of the ballot they'll see their traditional pick one. That's right. City council will be the ranked method. It will look a little different than our normal ballot. The other side will be the school board office and that will look exactly like the ballot that people have been voting on for years. And Minneapolis did ranked voting a few years ago. Are there any other cities this fall that are doing ranked voting? Uh, I'm not sure about area? this fall, but uh, probably the most prominent cities are San Francisco and Oakland. In San Francisco, they elect both their city and their county uh, offices by this ranked voting methodology. Oakland had a ranked voting election last year, and that's how their mayor got elected. For the wards that are up right now, Joe, which ones currently have enough people already on the ballot to have uh, three or more choices, let's say. I mean, obviously, in a pick one where you have one or the other, but in this instance, you can rank choices. Explain a little bit, which wards do people most need to be focused on in terms of that? The, the ranked voting really will take effect this year only in wards one, two, and three. And the reason for that is that in wards four, five, and six, there are only two candidates. Mm -hmm. And we don't anticipate that we're going to see much of any ranking going on there. In ward seven, there's only one candidate. And so there's, again, not much of an opportunity. But wards one, two, and three uh, have enough candidates that we may well see voters choose a first and a second choice or perhaps a first, second, and a third choice. And they could conceivably write in a candidate if they wanted to and rank that choice then. That's correct. The, the write-in spot is also, uh, also eligible for ranking if the voters want to go that route. And I know there's been some confusion or question about this. Do people, ha do people have to rank choices? If you, if you have just one person you want to vote for, uh, is that sufficient? You can mark that person and, and that's it? Or do you need, you know, are you required to rank them? Yeah, the ranking is not required that if you do, have you, have you locked in on your one candidate? That's the person you want to vote for. You're not interested in voting for anybody else. You are free to vote for the one person and not do any ranking. Okay. And at the beginning, we, you touched on kind of the process of ranking and, and how the voters need to sort of view that. Can you dig a little deeper into that and really kind of walk a voter through what they're going to see on the ballot um, and how they want to go through that to make sure? Because obviously we, 
if you if you think you made a mistake, you should always go back to the election judge and 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 just request a new ballot. But to avoid that as much as possible, walk us through a little bit more detail on how that works. When you get the ballot, uh, you'll notice that there will be uh, a number of columns that are labeled first choice, second choice, third choice, and so on. And and obviously, your uh, if you only have one choice, uh, th that would go in your first choice column. If you do have a second choice or additional choices, you would put them individually in the second the column, the third column, and so on. What we want to try to avoid is uh, people trying to put all of their votes in one column. So if you only have one vote, put that in the first choice column. If you have two choices, put one in the first column and then one in the second column. If I uh, am looking at my ballot and I don't want to rank choices, that's one thing. But if I decide to rank choices, and let's say, for the sake of argument, George Washington is my first choice, Thomas Jefferson is, Jefferson is my second choice, and John Adams is my third choice, does my ranking of those other two candidates hurt my first choice? Do I dilute or do I, do I minimize that vote at all? You know, that, that's a good question. And it's probably a better question to ask the candidates because they could probably talk more about the dynamics of how that situation works. But uh, for people who are afraid that, uh, that voting for additional candidates might harm their original choice, of course, the easy way around that is simply to, to make one choice and let it go at that. And if, and if somebody ranks a first, second, and third, let's say, I can't give three votes to one candidate. You I mean, can't. It, that option doesn't exist. If there are three candidates, you can, rank, you can vote for each one of them in each one of the rankings, but you can't vote multiple times for one. That's correct. In our system, you only get to cast one vote. And what you're doing, if you go with the second or the third choice, you're indicating your preference should your first choice not be for a winning candidate. But in the end, everybody just gets one vote. So we've talked a little bit now about how you vote and what you're going to see on the ballot. Explain to us now the counting process, because I know there's, you know, this is a completely new way of counting votes. And so walk us through a little bit what that looks like. Uh, on election day, this election will look just like any other election that we conduct in St. Paul, and that is you'll get a ballot, you'll mark it up, you'll put it into our ballot counter. At 8 o'clock at night, all the results will get transmitted back to us at our office. And if you look at our website that night, what you'll see is we will report uh, the votes for each candidate and how many votes they got as the first choice, the voter's second choice, the third choice, and so on. For the candidates who get a majority of the votes cast as the first choice, they're the winner, and for that race, the election is over. For the races where one candidate does not get up to 50%, then what we will have to do is take the ballots, examine them again, and start doing reallocation of the votes that were cast for the second and the third choices. We'll start doing the reallocation on November 14th, and we don't have any voting equipment to do that, so that process will be done manually. And for those who watched us do the recount the last two years, they'll recognize the process that we intended to use because it will look exactly like the recount did in 08 and in 10. Stacks of ballots, people sort of looking at them. So essentially, uh, it, whatever first place, uh, whatever candidate did not get enough to remain in the race, you take their ballots, and they're reallocated based on the second choice, correct? So if it was George Washington was the first one and Thomas Jefferson was the second and, and Washington didn't have enough to stay in the race, those, that vote would then be given to uh, Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson, correct? That, that's Something right. Along those lines. What, what, what we're going to do is we'll take all the ballots out of the, the sealed transfer case that we get back from the polling place at night, and we'll stack them up on the table by candidate. We'll then count them to make sure that we, you know, that we know exactly the number of votes. And uh, again, for people who have watched the recounts the last couple of years, they know that uh, we will actually count a few more votes manually as a result of inspecting every ballot than our ballot counter is, is able to catch. So we'll determine what the, what the count is manually, and then we'll determine which of the candidates don't have enough votes to win, even if they got all of the reallocated votes. Those candidates will get dropped. We'll then re-examine those ballots, the ballots that have votes for these low-ranking candidates, and we'll determine if those voters made a second or a third choice for a higher-ranked candidate 
who is still viable, still in the right. ball game. And if they did, we'll put those ballots on the appropriate candidate pile, recount, recount the pile, and figure out again, do we now have a majority winner? Do we have 50% plus one? Plus one, that's right. We'll keep doing that. We'll keep dropping the lower ranked candidates, reallocating those ballots until one of two things happens. Either number one, one of the existing candidates who is still, still active uh, has 50% plus one, or if we get down to the point where we only have two candidates left, then whoever has the most votes is the winner. And you mentioned that the counting starts on the 14th. When will, I mean, obviously it's difficult to say for, with any certainty, but um, any sense of how long that process will take and when folks will know who got elected to what, what offices? You know, based on the number of votes that are cast in city council elections uh, in past years, uh, we probably will finish that day. We'll finish on the 14th. If we have more than one ward to do, we'll bring in additional counting teams. But uh, again, for the people who watched us do the recount, uh, when we were doing the recount last year, we had 10 counting teams working simultaneously. So we'll bring uh, the appropriate number of election judges in to help us count. Uh, and our goal is to finish on Monday the 14th, and then the city council will be able to canvas the results when they meet on Wednesday the 16th. And I think the, in terms of counting, the last question that I sort of had in my mind was ties. How, are, how is a tie broken? If we have two candidates who ultimately end up, I mean, as, as unlikely as that might be, uh, what is the procedure for you know the margin of error like we saw with the recount with the U.S. Senate race? I mean, are all of those laws still in effect uh, in terms of triggering recounts and ties and how those things are broken? Exactly, because we, uh, even though we have a ranked voting ordinance in St. Paul, uh, we still operate under the state election law. And again, if there is a tie, the uh, the city council would break the tie by a lot, and whoever uh, you know whoever won the flip of the coin or the draw of the card, whatever they happen to do, uh, would be the winner. And at that point, the losing candidate could request a recount, but uh, we don't think that's going to be necessary. And, and one of the reasons that we're going to use our recount methodology to do this reallocation is that we want this to be completely transparent to both the candidates and to the right. public. And since the candidates and their attorneys, if they want to come to this, will have already seen every ballot, that we think there will not be any, any reason to do any recounts once we're done with the reallocation. And I know that sort of having access to that information, being able to watch it online or see it happen online in, in sort of a real time, I know that gave a lot of people a sense of confidence with the recount that they could just turn on public access television and actually watch that take place in front of them. So. Yes, and we anticipate that's exactly what's going to happen this year. And uh, as we as we have in the recounts, that uh, that either the uh, the candidates or their legal representatives will be able to sit or stand right at the table with us so they can see everything. And, and we think that that's really important, that, uh, that the candidates are able to see everything, that they're satisfied at the end of the day uh, who won and who lost the election. That one person will be happy, one or more will be unhappy, but uh, we want to make sure that everybody is satisfied that they know what the result of the election was. So one of the things that I wa also wanted to make sure we took some time to talk about a little bit is what are some of the common mistakes that people are likely to make? And again, remembering that if you think you made a mistake or if you did make a mistake, don't hesitate to go to an election judge and request a new ballot. But can you talk a little bit about some of the mistakes that people might uh, make or things that you've seen, for example, in, in maybe Minneapolis or San Francisco or other instances where ranked voting has been used so that they can make sure that they're aware of those and avoid it. Sure. And, and as you said, we do want to encourage people to uh, bring their ballot back and get a new ballot from us if they remotely even think that they made a mistake. We're, we're going to print plenty of ballots this year, way more than we're going to need, because we're not sure exactly how many, how many mistakes people will make. But we're anticipating the three most common mistakes will be these. Number one, that uh, some people will want to put all their choices in the first column. If they do that, our ballot counter will reject that, and then they'll get another opportunity. They'll get a new ballot. The, so they'll know right right when it goes to be counted, it'll be rejected, and right. someone will notify them you need to revote. Okay. That's right. The, the second common error that we think is going to happen is that people will get a little excited and uh, say, you know, I've got my one, my one candidate who I really like. I'm going to rank him or her as my first choice and as my second choice and right. my third choice. If they do that, 
under our ordinance, we will count the highest ranked choice for that candidate. So the, the voter will still get a vote cast, but we'll have to ignore any of the lower ranked choices from there. And then the other thing that we expect we may see, uh, especially from some of the absentee voters, is people uh, just putting a number next to somebody's name. Mm -hmm. Like they'll still put a number one next to their first choice, et cetera. And again, if, if we ever get to the, the reallocation phase where we are physically looking at the ballot and we see the one and the two and the three, we'll be able to count it because we can determine the voters' intent. But we will not know that on election day and our, our voting equipment will miss uh, votes that are made in that fashion. So we are going to actively try to persuade our voters not to make any of those three those three mistakes. And it's filling it's filling the oval, right? So no no lines, no notes in the mar margins, no numbers, as you said. I know that sometimes people will say, you know, they'll mark something and they'll say, no, not this one. I meant this one. You want to, if if you get to that place where you think you've made a mistake. Get yourself a new ballot. Exactly, and I think the benefit of the last two recounts, uh, especially the Coleman Franken recount, was I think people now understand the importance of completely filling in the oval next to the the, the name of the candidate that they want to vote for, and uh, and I'm sure our voters will do that this year. And in an effort to avoid some of these mistakes, obviously you need a lot of support. You've got election judges, interpreters, translators, you've got written materials that I know have been worked on. Talk a little bit about those resources and what's gonna be available in the polling places. And I would assume, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume you would always welcome having more election judges uh, at least contacting you and offering up services, especially ones that speak multiple languages. Uh, absolutely. We're obviously, we're always looking for multilingual election judges, and uh, people should contact us if they're interested in doing that this year, and of course in next year and future years as well. Uh, I, would, uh, I would encourage all of our voters to go to our website, which is rcelections.org, and when they, when they get there, uh, they'll see that we have uh, three videos set up that will enable them to, to watch what we're, we're going to be doing and what was likely to happen in the polling place. We have informational pamphlets available in English, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong. Uh, we have some instructions, written instructions that voters can look at or if they want to. They can print them out and bring them with to the polling place. And some other materials that are, that are on the website that we think will be of interest. At the polling place, uh, we will have a greeter election judge at every polling place who will talk individually to everyone who walks in to the polling place. And we'll want to make sure that everyone gets at least a very brief explanation of what ranked voting is and how uh, we want to have people mark the ballot. Shortly before election day, uh, every household in the city that has at least one registered voter will also get a mailing from us that will, again, will provide some brief instructions on, on how this process works and provide our, our web address, which I will say again is rcelections.org. Okay. Now, so you'll have, you mentioned that you've got stuff online that people can print off. My quick question to that is, can they bring that into the voting booth with them? So if they've got a, a printout piece of paper that had those instructions, are they allowed to take that in that with them? Yes. And in okay. fact, if, if, even if they have a sample ballot from a candidate or one of the campaigns, they can bring that to the polling place with them. They can bring that into the voting booth with them. Uh, what they can't do is to is to show it or wave it around in the polling place, and uh, we can't have those materials passed out by the candidates either in the polling place or near our polling place. But uh, but if the uh, if the candidates give you something, uh, you can bring it to you, bring it with uh, to the polling place, bring it in the voting booth. Just make sure that you're not showing it to anybody else. So this is a test that allows cheat sheets, is what you're saying? Exactly. That's right. <laughs> uh, couple last things before we wrap up. Uh, what will this mean in terms of the cost uh, for conducting elections? Do we expect to see higher costs, lower costs? Obviously, I think the primary, you know, the primary was eliminated. So talk a little bit about what that means to the bottom line, because I know that's always a question people ask. You know, Jake, the jury is still out really on the cost issue. And this year, the, uh, our, our school board elected not to have a primary, and that was, that was their choice. Uh, of course, they could come to a different conclusion in 2013. So uh, two years from now, we might well have a school district primary, in which case, you know, there will be no cost savings. Uh, this year, 
uh, even though we, we didn't have a primary, you know, we had a couple of special elections that we had to conduct earlier in the year to fill a vacancy in the, in the legislature, which uh, used up some of those savings. But uh, even with that, our informational campaign is, is taking up some money that n we normally would not spend as a part of a, of a normal city election. So uh, once we get past the election, I'll have a better idea whether we either saved money or maybe spent a little more than we normally would have. And, uh, and again, given the fact that the school board is not covered by this ranked voting law, if they elect to have a primary again in the future, then you know that would eliminate any potential cost saving that we might have. So for resources and information on ranked voting, you've got your website, rcelections.org, correct? That's right. Is there a phone number set up or a place that they can call? Can they get that off the website? Yes, and, and for people who either are uncomfortable using a computer or don't have a computer available, they can also call our staff at 651-266-2171. Thanks again, Joe, for joining us. Really you bet, Jake. Your time. So if you missed anything or you want to review it, www.rcelections.org is the website for Ramsey County Elections. The City of St. Paul also has a link in its website that will take you to the, uh, to the Ramsey County website so you can get all the information. You'll be able to see those videos that Joe mentioned that will show you what to expect when you come into the polling place, the right way to vote and the wrong way to vote. Uh, it would be very, very helpful. So thanks so much and uh, happy voting in November.